Good morning and uh, a warm welcome to our service here at Cumbernauld Church this morning. My name is Vic McLaughlin, I'm a, a member here at the church and I'll be leading us into the service as we start this morning. And as I say a warm welcome everyone, particularly if you're visiting us for the, the first time or you're just dropping by, we hope you enjoy the service and we'd love to see you again and we'd love to hear from you even at some point. So a welcome to you. And I'd like to add this little bit in here as well. You know, these are strange times that we find ourselves in. And there may be someone sitting there this morning who is carrying a burden, maybe a burden related to the situation that we're in, or it may be something else. Please know, please know that you're loved. And please know that God sees you where you are just now and he loves you. And, and reach out to us. You'll be able to get us on Facebook. We're easily contactable. You, you would catch us through YouTube, a message there. Whatever. Please don't struggle alone, but a special, special welcome to you. Now, the service this morning, um, I, I will lead a call to worship shortly, and then we will have some uh, songs and we'll have some prayer, and Alison will lead us in the children's talk. And after that, we'll have a reading from the book of James as we continue our, our series in that. And following that, Andy, our minister, will lead us in a sermon. So, without much further ado, I will lead us in the call to worship. Now, our call to worship comes from Malachi 3, 6. Uh, and it's a very short call to worship. And it is, I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Very short. This world that we, are, we live in is always in a state of change. And what just seems to change for us is the right of it. In times of chaos and upset, it tends to move fast. In times of peace and calm, it tends to move slow and not really change at all. Now, I think we could safely say we're currently in the fast lane of change in this, in, in this world, and particularly in this country. Um, we've just come out a, a, a couple of years of Brexit. And uh, now we have moved into a pandemic and now there is a, there is a, a global uh, seminal moment of the awareness of a great evil that exists in our world, racism. And it's a seminal moment of the change in the thinking of people. Now with change often comes three things, excitement, fear and pain. Sometimes you get one, excitement if you get a new job. Other times it's two, excitement and fear if you get a new job. And on rare occasions you get all three, excitement, fear and pain. And we can safely say this is one of those times. We are in a rapidly fast changing world and there is so much excitement, fear and pain, probably more of the latter too. We are definitely um, accompanied by the three horsemen of change. And it was Mary Shelley that said that one of the greatest pains that the human mind can suffer is sudden change. I wouldn't go all the way with that. But I understand what she's saying. Know this, that is the human experience. It is not God's experience. Our God does not change as it says in Malachi. He is unmovable, he is unshakable in his person, in his character, in his promises. He is the rock, the rock of ages on which we stand. And in times of turmoil and chaos, he is the one we look to. And with that, this morning, we come here in that safety, in that certainty that he is unmovable. He is the foundation of everything. We come to pray, we come to praise, we come to worship him. And with that in mind, let us join together as we sing a great song, a great song to God as we sing in Christ alone. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm to the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace When fears are stilled, when striving cease My comforter, 
my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones He came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on Him was laid Here in the death of Christ I live There in the ground His body lay Light of the world by darkness slain Then bursting forth in glorious day Up from the grave he rose again And as he stands in victory Since curse has lost its grip on me For I am his and he is mine Bob with the precious blood of Christ No guilt in life, no fear in death This is the power of Christ in me From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I stand. Thank you for that. Terrific singing once again. And I hope you let the neighbours hear you. And uh, I hope you let them know that they should be praising God this day as well. And now what we're going to do, folks, is I'm going to lead you in, in, in a prayer this morning, a congregational prayer that, that, that's relative to many, many things. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that you are eternally unchanging in your character, your plans and your promises. You are the one constant in our lives for whom we crave. You are the one we want to build our hope upon and place our trust in. Forgive us, Father, for all the times we have willfully and unknowingly turned from you, ignored you, rejected you and despised you in our selfishness, fear and our arrogance. You are the Father who has said from the dawn of creation that you would love us, care for us, and dwell with us in your love for all eternity. And yet, we reject you in our ways, our speech, and our thoughts. Forgive us, Father, please, we beg of you. Do not turn your face away from us. We are often lost and we are often confused and fearful in an ever rapidly changing world. In your mercy, in the name of your Son Jesus, we beg you, do not abandon us. Do not abandon your church at this time. Lead us. Lead us boldly in your ways and make of us a people who will honour you in all that we say, think and do. Heavenly Father, we live in an age at a time when lies, deception and deliberate misinformation 
swamp our world through different media outlets. We pray, Father, for our leaders of every political hue that firstly, they would be truly saved, that they would know the salvation of Jesus Christ in their lives and in their hearts, and that they would turn to you. We pray that they would shun the deception and honour the truth, that they would calm the anger, the fears and the frustrations of the people they govern through open and honest relationship with the truth, that they would make decisions based on the truth, regardless of how fearful or difficult it may seem to them. We pray that people would create a place within their hearts to allow our leaders to do this. Father, we continue to pray for all who are still working in the world and in our country in the face of this COVID disease. They are working to make the necessities of life available for those of us who have been kept safe in our homes. Whether those workers are in the NHS, in shops, in the transport system, in factories or local services. Protect them, Father, and their families. Calm their fears and give them strength as they go about their work. Father, we pray that you would guide and strengthen our church leaders in the weeks, days and months ahead as they grapple with the difficulties of church in its new form as created by the situation that we now find ourselves in. Help congregations, Father, throughout the land to be understanding of these difficulties and to open their hearts and minds to your plans for your church as they become clearer. Father, we long for the day when we can meet together as your church, as the Israelites in exile long to worship in Jerusalem. Not for our sake, but to be able to praise and worship you as a family, to raise our voices in song and sit side by side, brothers and sisters, as you speak to us through your word. Father, please give us the patience and the understanding to await your decision on this. We thank you, Father, for all the people who have come forward and given their talents and their time and embraced the challenge of creating a new space for us to praise and worship you remotely from our church building. We also, Father, pray for the sick and lonely at this time where the difficulty of living has been magnified by the isolation of this disease. We pray for those who live on their own, either through illness or circumstance, who would normally but cannot now alleviate their sense of separation through meeting and visiting with friends and families. Give them the sense of comfort and belonging that comes from being loved by you. And Father, at this time in our world and and in our country, there is a virus, a virus that has destroyed many lives, a virus of the heart. It seeks to dominate, denigrate and annihilate. It seeks to deny the godly image bearing of all humanity. It discriminates and yet is indiscriminate in its attacks on women and women and children of colour. Father, this evil is racism and it comes from the sinful hearts of men and women and is so ingrained in our world that those not attacked by it are often complicit or blind to it. Father, Heal the broken hearts of the men and women and children whose lives have been blighted and destroyed by this scourge. Comfort them and pour out your healing love upon them. Deliver justice to them that they may see your glorious righteousness. And Father, place forgiveness in their hearts that for their sake they may know peace in your great love. 
Open the eyes of those of us who have never been affected by this, Father. Open our eyes to it in our world, in our country, in our workplaces, in our homes, and most of all in our hearts. Father, our Lord Jesus Christ healed the blind man's eyes that he could see again. Father, please heal the blind eyes of our hearts. And we ask, Father, that you would also remove the hatred and fear from the hearts of those who would perpetrate this evil. Father, lead them to Christ, we beg. We beg of you, Father. Give us knowledge of our hearts, courage, and the love of Jesus in our hearts to stand up and against the horrific sin that is racism. Not just for a season, but for a lifetime. In Jesus' name, and for your glory, Father, we ask all these things. Amen. Now let us worship God by singing Psalm 61. Oh, hear my urgent cry, my God, and listen to my plea. From earth's remotest bands I call, when my heart faints in me. great that everyone is able to join with us this morning. Uh, we're especially grateful for the young people and we're going to have a wee story, a wee time of uh, chatting with them. Um, so we're going to uh, discuss about what we're going to be doing over the next few weeks uh, with the young people um, and then we'll get into a wee story. So first this is my lovely wife Katrina um, and what do you do for a living Katrina? I'm a graphic designer. All right okay can you prove that you're a graphic designer? Um, well, that's where I go every day to go to work to do graphic design things. Yeah, but like I see you leave every day, but and I see you working here during lockdown, but nobody else knows that. How can you prove to everybody watching, to the young people especially, that you're a graphic designer? Do you have any hard proof? Well, I've made some things that I've sold and people have bought them. Yeah, I mean, let's see. They're good, like, Thanks. but, you know, you could have just printed that off the internet, I don't know. It's true. It's got your name on the back, but that doesn't, you know, you could have fabricated it. Like, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be real. Do you have any hard evidence that you're a qualified graphic designer? Why can I believe that you made this? 
I mean, in terms of qualifications, I have my degree that I was given after four years of studying mm. graphic design. It's even got the wee shiny bit. What does that mean? To show it's just a shiny bit to show that it's real. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe. You could have made that though if you're such a good graphic designer. True. Yeah, but you're telling me that you studied for four years and you got this degree. You worked hard for it and all that stuff, right? So you present, presented three bits of evidence, so I now have to concede that you are a graphic designer. I'm you've, glad. Pr you've proved it to me and to everybody else that you're a graphic designer. I'm glad you've cleared that up. Okay, thank you very much, Katrina. You're welcome. So that is what we're going to be talking about this morning. We're going to be discussing how Jesus um, is the Son of God and how events that he uh, did and the things that he performed uh, prove that he was the Son of God, that he is the Messiah. But the way that we're going to do that is through a guy named John. He was Jesus' disciple and he wrote all this stuff down uh, so that he could prove that he was, that Jesus was the Son of God. So, I'm sure most of you have been to a birthday party before. I'm sure, um, you know, the birthday parties that you've been to, they've been full of juice and food and sweets and cakes um, and there was loads of fun. You had fun with your friends, there was games that you could play, past partial, all that stuff. And when you go to a party, you expect there to be enough food. You expect there to be lots of sweets, uh, lots of juice, um, and you'd be pretty disappointed if you ran out, if they ran out of food before you had even got any. Well, that's similar to what happened um, in the story in the Bible that we're going to look at today. Just like there needs to be enough uh, at the party for everybody to enjoy it, there had to be enough in this uh, story as well. The man who wrote down this name, uh, th who wrote down this event, was named John, as we've said before. Um, and he wrote down uh, these events. Over the next seven weeks, we're going to be looking at uh, different things that John has written down for us to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Um, and this is the whole point of him writing the book. Uh, he wrote it a wee while after Jesus had um, been risen, and he's writing all this stuff down so that people would believe that he is who he said he was, the Son of God. In this story, uh, Jesus and his family attend a wedding. And at the wedding, uh, we will see that a disaster happens, but the right man is there to do something amazing. So, as a wee intro to why we're looking at um, this story today, uh, I've got a wee brochure. So this is, this is top 10 places to go in Marrakesh. And we were thinking, when we got married, we were thinking about going to Marrakesh on our honeymoon, but we ended up not going. But we bought this brochure, and you see this photo, it looks amazing. It looks so incredible. Like, just all the different um, architecture, it just looks, it looks like an amazing place to be. Um, and from all the photos that are in this book, we can see that Marrakesh and Morocco is just stunning. But it doesn't compare to how amazing it would be to actually be there. I've never been, but if you go to that place, it would be so much more magnificent than just looking at it in a brochure. That's a wee bit like what this story is. G John has written this down so that we can know what it's gonna be like. Jesus is providing for us when we go to heaven, when we're with him forever for those who believe in him. And it's just a small picture. This story is a small picture of what it will be like um, when we go to be with him for the rest of uh, eternity. So let me tell you the story. Jesus is at a wedding and the host of the wedding has run out of wine. This would have been so embarrassing for the host and the guests at the wedding might have gone away not enjoying the wedding at all. Just like if there wasn't enough food or sweets at a party. It's just a disaster. So Jesus' mother comes to Jesus and asks him to help. She probably wouldn't have wanted the host to be embarrassed. Jesus said that even though he had a more important job to do, that he would, he would help her out, he would help out. So Jesus asked to get six huge water jugs. Then the man who was in charge of the wedding, he was in charge of the food and the drink, he was in charge of the wine, so he was probably a wee bit nervous, probably sweating, probably, you know, a wee bit embarrassed about the whole situation. So he comes to taste the water. But amazingly, it had all been turned into wine. 
Not only that though, the wine that Jesus had miraculously turned from water was so much better than the original wine that the guy had brought to the wedding in the first place. So the wedding was a great success. Uh, everyone had enough wine, everyone had a good time, and everyone enjoyed the wedding. But the important thing was that the disciples believed that Jesus was God's glorious son. The whole point of this story and the rest of the stories that we will look at over the next few weeks will show us that Jesus really is uh, the saviour and he shows us what we need to do. People saw what Jesus did and wrote them down so that we could know too. And that means we need to respond to these stories. We can't just read them and go away. We have to do something with them. And the Bible teaches us that Jesus will come back one day and everyone who trusted and believed in him will be together in paradise forever. So what do we have to do now? We have to trust Jesus as our personal king. And if we do, then we can look forward to the most amazing party when he comes back. Good morning everybody. This morning we're going to be reading from chapter 2 in James, verse 14 to the end of the chapter. A section titled Faith and Deeds. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm and well, and keep well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs. What good is it? In the same way, faith itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God, Good, even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do, and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did, when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. How can the young keep their life pure by doing what your word demands? I seek you. Oh, oh.
Well, good morning, and let me add my welcome to that of Vix. It's great that you're joining us for our service of worship this morning, and we now come to our sermon. So it'd be really helpful if you could have a Bible open in front of you at James chapter 2. James chapter 2 and verses 14 through 26. I'm going to pray as we come to this passage and just ask God for his help as we look at it together. God, as we open up our Bibles in front of us, we pray that you would open up our ears, open up our hearts and open up our eyes of faith. Because we want to hear you, hear from you. We want to receive the truth of your word into our lives. And we want to see you and your son with the eyes of faith. We pray this in his precious and powerful name. Amen. Life is full of questions. On a daily basis, we are asked questions. So children will ask their parents, what's for dinner tonight? Or husbands will ask their wives, where are my car keys? Wives will ask their husbands, when are you going to be home? We are people who right now are spending a lot of time on technology and on a daily basis we face questions. Facebook asks us, what are you thinking? Websites ask us, do you want to agree to this privacy statement on this website or do you want to, do you accept the cookies? And it sounds so harmful and we just say, I agree or I accept, not knowing what we've just signed our, that we've signed our life away. Zoom's constantly asking us, do you want to sign in with audio? And we all do that when we go on a Zoom meeting, because why else would we go on a Zoom meeting but to hear and to speak? I really don't know why Zoom asks us, do we want to dial in with audio? These are fairly mundane questions that we face on a daily basis, but there are some points in our lives where we face more significant questions. For example, questions like, will you marry me? Or, will you put an offer in this house today? Or, are you willing to go through with this operation? It's a last resort. Or, are you going to accept this job that we're offering you? We face all sorts of significant questions at various stages in our lives. Questions which have huge life-altering implications. But I would contend that in this passage before us, James is going to ask a number of big questions, significant questions, questions that have implications for our eternal destiny. Just look down at verse 14. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? I wonder how you would answer that question. Can faith without deeds save a person, is what James is asking. How would you answer that question? Well, we're going to be looking at how James would answer that question as we walk through this passage. And and over the last few weeks, we've seen that at the heart of this little letter, one of the key themes is faith that works. You see, James is concerned that his readers and us today would be people who have a faith that works, that produces good works, faith that makes a difference, faith that's genuine and real. It's easy, isn't it, to to tick at census and say, I'm a Christian. It can be easy to profess faith and say to someone, I'm a Christian. It's easy to give intellectual assent for some people, not all people in our culture, but for some people to say, I give assent to the the core truths of the Christian faith. But faith like that on its own, James would say, is meaningless, useless. Faith that is genuine and real is a faith that works. And this is James's key theme that he wants to drive home to us today. Now, what we're going to do is look at how James would answer the question that he asks in verse 14 by walking through verses 15 through 26. Now, what James does in these verses is he first highlights what counterfeit faith looks like and then he highlights what genuine faith looks like. And for each, he provides two illustrations. So let's look at what counterfeit faith looks like. Look at verses 15 through 17. Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, 
Go in peace. Keep warm and well fed. But there's nothing about their physical needs. What good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. James first answers his question by giving this really powerful illustration of what counterfeit faith looks like. Now I suspect that this illustration he uses would have been really pertinent for his first century readers. Remember I said way back in week one that James's original audience were people who had fled from persecution in Jerusalem and scattered themselves throughout the first century world. No doubt many of them who left in a hurry had to leave behind their, their money, their belongings, and so they left with, the, with very little. Maybe just the basic necessities of life. And, and so it wouldn't be hard for them to imagine someone who was without clothes and without food. And James asks, when, when, when you see someone like this, right? Suppose you see someone like this. Right? Imagine saying, go in peace. Keep warm and well fed. This hypothetical response at first sounds utterly ridiculous. Like, who would say that to someone who's naked and hungry? But don't brush it off. This is a reality of people who, who possess a counterfeit faith. Let me press pause for a moment and ask you a soul-searching question. Are you the sort of person that could pass by someone, a, per, a poor person on the street, and perhaps wish them a good day or God bless them and do nothing? How many times have you passed a homeless person in the city centre of Glasgow? Said some nice words but did absolutely nothing for them. Let me press play again. You see what James is saying here is merely wishing someone well in the face of their need coupled with your ability to help them is actually an indication of counterfeit faith. If we have the means to meet someone's need before us and choose not to, no amount of nice sounding words will make up for it. Look at what James says in, in verse 16. He says to them, he says, if you do nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? What good is it to say something nice to them and do nothing? And that's the second time James has asked that question in just a couple of verses. What good is it? Like, think about it. What good is it to have the ability to help someone, say something nice, and do absolutely nothing? Words without corresponding actions are just empty, useless. They mean nothing. And in verse 17, James reveals his big point. In the same way, faith by itself if not accompanied by action, is dead. The Bible is clear. A person who possesses faith in Jesus Christ sees a brother or sister in need ought to do something about it. Because if we've been born again by the Spirit of God, we've got a new heart, a new mind, and new affections. We will live like Jesus lived and we will live with care and compassion. James's expectations is that expectation is that genuine believers who have a genuine faith will practically help people. Now this is an obligation that we have not just to help brothers and sisters, that's what James says here, that means fellow Christians, but we will help people who are not just within our church family, but who are in our community, who are in our country, who are across the globe, even even people who we might call our enemies. And the reason I say that is because it's what Jesus taught in the parable of the Good Samaritan. We are to love our neighbour, our enemies. But let's stay with the point that James is making here. If you see a brother or sister in need and you just wish them and you just wish them a few good words but do nothing, it's meaningless. 
It's not just James who says this in the New Testament. Paul says this. So Paul says in one place, I think it's Galatians, he says, Let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of faith. And then in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, he says, Anyone who does not provide for their family, and especially for their own household, has denied the faith and is and is worse than an unbeliever. You see, he says, if you if you are call yourself a genuine Christian, but you don't care, you're worse than someone who who wouldn't be a, a believer. It's the same point that James is making here. No care, no compassion, no action means counterfeit faith. Lifeless, false faith. Deedless Christianity is dead. Deedless Christianity is dead Christianity. Real faith works. So let's examine our souls. Can we think of any of our brothers and sisters who are in need? Can we do anything about it? James says we ought to. A genuine Christian with a genuine faith that works will do something about it. And that ought to challenge us. We can help people in our own church family who at this time are in need in lockdown. We can help our brothers and sisters in our wider church family, whether it's our brothers and sisters in India who right now are going through great difficulties. Have we done anything about it? Now, church family in Cumbernauld, as we're, we're feeling the sting of James's challenge, can I just say a word as, as your pastor? One of the things that's really, really encouraged me in this time of lockdown is how the church family in Cumbernauld have risen to the challenge of lockdown, risen to the challenge of caring for one another at this time. I'm so heartened that the, the, the various ways I've heard of people who have given really generously to our church or to, to India. I've heard of people give anonymous gifts of money to members in our church and anonymous food parcels. I've heard of people who've gone out and served with Bethany in Edinburgh. I've heard of people who've been utterly committed to their buddy and the buddy system that was set up earlier on. And these stories have just heartened me. I've heard of people who've who've given someone a phone call or a visit and it's just been so timely. And it's so encouraging as a pastor of Cumbernauld Free Church to know that there is faith that works. Real faith. And James here is challenging us, every single one of us in our church, to examine and see if our faith is genuine. Now, let me be really clear here because some people can get the gospel confused or, or and by that I mean how one gets right with God. Let me be clear. We do not earn salvation by serving or obeying God. We come to salvation by faith alone, in Christ alone, because of the grace of God alone and to his glory alone. But... Actions show that our commitment to God is real. Works of loving service are not a substitute for, but rather a verification of our faith in Christ. And so one of the really beautiful things is that when people are doing good works to one another, it is a sign, it is a, it's a verification that the faith that you have in Christ is real. Now, James's next illustration makes the point even more forcefully. If, if in Sam Albury's little book on um, James, he, he calls the, the first illustration, the one we've just looked at, the armchair philanthropist. Well, this next uh, illustration we're going to see in just a few moments is going to be the doctrinally orthodox demon. But look at what James says in verse 18. He, he imagines an objector who says, in response to what he's just said, you have faith, I have deeds. You see that in verse... 18, but someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. And, and in this objector's minds, there's two types of Christians. There, there's the type of Christian who's got faith. They, they, they give their intellectual assent to Christian doctrine and they believe. And then there's another type of Christian and they're the practical type. They're the person who goes out and they do good works. But James, th this idea of there being two different types of Christian doesn't wash with James. 
that there can be somebody who's got faith and someone who's got deeds. James says the two always go together. So his response is, show me your faith without deeds and I'll show you my faith by my deeds. Genuine faith always has, is accompanied with deeds. And, and, and that's because faith is, is, is not just an invisible thing, it is a visible thing. What do I mean by that? Well, remember in the Gospels, Mark's Gospel, that there's this account of the paralytic man. And these men bring their friend who is paralysed on a mat to Jesus. And they arrive at the home and the home is so full of people that they, they can't get through the front door. So they have to climb up onto the roof and they have to literally make a hole in the roof and lower their friend down on his mat. We read that Jesus saw their faith and said to the man, son, your sins are forgiven. You see, that's the thing about faith. Faith can be seen in how people behave. Truth, faith can be seen. Counterfeit faith is invisible. I'm a person of faith. And yet there is no evidence in your life that your faith in Christ is making a difference. Counterfeit. Now, let me let me just also add, there are many people in our communities who, who, who would never describe themselves as people of faith. In fact, quite the opposite. They would say they're atheists and they do good works and they're really kind and they're really generous. In fact, I know many people who are not Christians who are, I would say, more loving, more caring and more generous than some Christians than I, that I know. James isn't speaking about people like that, but he's speaking about people who claim to have faith in Jesus Christ. He's saying they ought to be known for their good works. Some Christians think it's just enough to give intellectual assent to Christian doctrine. But James, knowing that, drives his point home with even greater force. Look at verse 19. Somebody who thinks it's just enough to have faith. Look at what he says in verse 19. He puts them in the same category as a demon. You believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. Now this is a really powerful illustration. The doctrinally orthodox demon. A test of orthodoxy, Christian orthodoxy, is that you believe that there is one God and he is one. So we believe in God. We believe in God. He is the, the, the God that the Bible reveals. He, we believe that he is God alone. There is no other gods. He alone is God. He is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He, he is one. Three at one. In the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy, the, the great Christian confession is, Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Jesus affirmed this truth in Matthew's Gospel. We confess it when we confess some of the creeds. We believe in one God. Yet believing in this alone is not enough. It means nothing. Because James says even the demons believe it. So if we're tempted to pat ourselves in the back because we've got, uh, because of our orthodoxy, we've got right doctrine, we need to remember that the ones that we share it with, the demons have sound doctrine. They know who God is. They affirm belief in one God. Someone has said, Hell is full of great theologians with orthodox theology. Notice what James adds. James says, you believe there's one God? Good. Even the demons believe that. And shudder. When he, when he adds that and shudder, what he's saying is demons believe this truth and they're affected by it. They shudder at it. And yet you say you've got faith and there's no evidence that it's had an impact upon your life. And if that's the case, your faith is counterfeit. Your faith is false. Your faith is not genuine. So, so there, there's James's two illustrations. The armchair philanthropist and the doctrinally orthodox demon. Both illustrations say that to say that you have faith but yet have no deeds 
it's meaningless. Well, James now turns his attention to what genuine faith looks like. And again, he provides two examples. And this time he's going to use two examples from the Old Testament. He's going to use Abraham, the father of faith, or the, the, the great archetype of faith in the Bible. And then he's going to, and Abraham, the patriarch. And then he's going to use Rahab, the prostitute. You can get two people in the Old Testament who are more different, but he uses this to make this glorious point that faith comes in different shapes and sizes and different kinds of people. So, so, so if you've got your Bibles there, just look down at verse 20. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? There's a sense in which James wishes he didn't have to make this next argument, but he knows he has to make this argument because so many people just don't get it, and he really wants us to get it because, listen, the question he began with in verse 14, it's of eternal significance. It's of eternal significance. Uh, is eternal implications whether we'll receive the mercy of God in the day of judgment or the judgment of God in the day of judgment so 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 this is what he says look at verse 20 now to 23 you foolish person do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless was not our father Abram considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar you see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did and the scripture was fulfilled that says Abram believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. So what James does in this illustration is he takes us back to the very first book in the Bible, Genesis, and he takes us to the, the, the great man of faith, Abraham, and he shows us how in his life faith and works are connected. So in Genesis chapter 22 we read that God tested Abraham and what God did was he asked Abraham to take his one and only son and to take him to the Mount Moriah where he was to sacrifice him. Now humanly speaking when you read that story it's one of the most challenging stories because we know that God's not someone who at all ex um, accepts uh, child sacrifice. So it's a strange test but it's a, it's a really powerful test. He's testing Abraham and he says, take your one and only son. But what makes it really strange isn't just that fact, it's this fact. God had made a promise to Abraham in chapter 12 where he said, Abraham, I'm going to take you, and Abraham was at this stage an old man, and I'm going to make you into a great nation. In other words, I'm going to give you loads of descendants. And he says in chapter 15, these descendants are going to number the, the, sea, the sand and the seashore, the stars in the sky. And yet here's God in Genesis 22 telling Abraham... Take your one and only son and you're going to sacrifice him. Now we read in Genesis chapter 15 that when Abraham had that promise, you're going to have great descendants reaffirmed to him, that when he believed, when he put his faith alone in Christ and in God alone, in the promise of God, that it was credited to him as righteousness. Because remember, the key thing is we're saved by faith alone in God alone, in Christ alone. And so you get to chapter 22 and, the, and, and, and the, the whole test is, will Abraham go through with it? And he does. But right at the moment where you think he's going to sacrifice his son, God intervenes and says, Abraham, stop. And he gives an animal instead as a substitute. And Abraham has Isaac, gets to keep Isaac. But the whole thing was a test to see if his faith, his faith would be put into practice, he, that he would obey what God had asked of him. And so that's why James says in verse 22, you see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. You see, that's the key. Faith has to work. And that leads James to the, the first of his two conclusions. Look at verse 24. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. Now, if you read this sentence out of context and it's on, on, on its own, it's one of the most troubling verses because it seems to contradict what, the, what Paul says in Romans and what Paul says in Ephesians. That we're not saved by works. That, that's not what we believe as Christians, but we're saved by faith. Faith alone and Christ alone. And yet he says here... You see, that person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. 
And so many people start to struggle because they, they know what Paul says in Romans 3.28. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or Ephesians 2 verse 8. For it's by grace you've been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves. It's the gift of God. Not by works. So that no one can boast. Paul is emphatic, we're justified by faith alone and not by our works. But here James seems to be equally emphatic. We're justified by what we do and not by faith alone. So these two New Testament writers have often been pitted against and said, look, they're diametrically opposed on what they say. But but actually, if we look at what James is saying in context, not plucking this verse out of its context, we actually see that there isn't a flat out contradiction you see when we take what James is saying in context we see that James insists that the kind of faith that truly justifies is the faith that works is a faith that is alone we're saved by faith alone but not a faith that is alone it is accompanied with works it's a faith that moves beyond believing what is true and even uh, and it's a faith that rests in the promises and acts in the promises of god it's a faith that is inseparable from good works and if you know that section in ephesians chapter 2 where where we're told that we're saved by faith alone because the grace of god alone not by our works what is paul going and say in verse 10 we're god's workmanship prepared with and what, what are we here to do we're we're here to do the good works that God has prepared in advance for us to do. You see, one of the ways to understand that these two, Paul and James, aren't contradicted in each other is to understand Paul in context. You see, what Paul often used to emphasise in his letter writing was to make it absolutely clear that we're saved by faith alone. And often, to, to, to make that case really clear, he would always state, definitely not by works. We're not saved by the works we do. It's not just do good works and then you go to heaven. No, we're saved by faith alone in Christ alone. And so he would emphasize that in Romans 3 and 4 and in Ephesians chapter 2. But in those same context, in those same letters, in those same places, he will go on and speak about the importance of a faith that is accompanied with obedience. A faith that is accompanied with good works. And James in this letter, he's, he's emphasizing the fact that some people just say, I've got faith and they have no works. So he's, he's emphasizing the other side of the coin and he's saying, no, no, a genuine faith is a faith that works. And so when understood in, in, in so when understood in their context, it's clear that James doesn't contradict Paul. On the contrary, they complement each other. I just want to read from two great theologians, John Murray who, who, and uh, R.C. Sproul. John Murray says, Faith alone justifies, but a justified person with faith alone would be a monstrosity which never exists in the kingdom of grace. Faith works itself out through love, and faith without works is dead. R.C. Sproul. The, the relationship of faith and good works is one that may be dis distinguished but never separated if good works do not follow from our profession of faith it is a clear indication that we do not possess justifying faith the reformed formula is this we are justified by faith alone but not by a faith that is alone so that's 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 what James says in his first illustration but now he's got a second illustration and it involves Rahab the prostitute in the same way, look at verse 25. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? As the body without f the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. S -s -s Rahab couldn't be more different from Abraham. Abraham's a patriarch, Rahab's a prostitute. Abraham's a Jew, Rahab's a Gentile. Abraham was rich, Rahab was poor. Yet they both illustrate in their lives the same point. True faith is shown by actions. Remember our story? She's, our story is told in the book of Joshua. The people of God are going to uh, receive the promised land. And so they send in their spies to, 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 to check out um, the land. And when they go in, the, the, the police, the Jericho police, knock at Rahab's door because they know that the spies have ended up in our home. And yet Rahab covers for them. 
she sends the police in the wrong direction and then she lets the spies slip out and and what she does in that act is she shows that her life aligns with the mission of God's people and they're entirely cross purposes with her own people the land living the people living in Canaan and and, and what she does shows that she has faith in the God of the Israelites She's heard what God has done, she's trusted in his promises, and she recognised that God was Lord over all, and in believing in him, she acted. And she doesn't just offer a pardon, guys, keep safe, go on your way, be in peace. Now she does something about what she believes. She acts. She hides them. She lets him go. Faith accompanied with works. And so James comes to the conclusion, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. And James uses this image of a lifeless body to make his point. Professions of faith, claiming to be a Christian, claiming to believe in God, you might think is impressive or is, is good. James says, it's like a dead body awaiting the grave. Because real faith is alive. It works. It's visible and it's active. It does things. I love what Sam Albury says. We do not always live what we say we believe or think we believe, but we do always believe what we live out. So the question is, are we demonstrating deeds that come from true faith? Or are we in danger of hiding behind claims of faith that have no evidence from our lifestyle? As we wrap this up, let me press pause and let me bring some applications. There will be two different ways that we hear this message in some ways. There will be some of us who hear this as Christians and we've got a really sense of conscience, really tender conscience. And, and, and we're hearing the challenge of God's word. We feel like the Holy Spirit has like come inside of us and he's really convicting us. And we're looking at our lives and we're thinking, man, I don't see good works in my life. Because we're, we're, we're those who can often beat ourselves up. And, and one of the things that some people who are, who are listening to this message might feel really convicted and feel, I don't know if I'm a Christian. Well, listen, one of the realities those of us who have tender our sense of consciousness need to be aware of, we can sometimes be blind to the good fruit that is in our life. Yeah, we live imperfect lives, but we are those who are seeking to obey and to do good works. And if you're one of those people, right, who've got a really sensitive of conscience, I, want, I just want you to, to reflect in your, 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 your Christian life. And think, do I give? Do I love? Do I care for others? And just think about the various ways you have. And, and, and take encouragement, yes, imperfectly. And if you see fruit and evidence, then, then know this, you're a true Christian. But you're feeling the challenge of God's word, as we all are. There are other people who listen to this and they're like, man, I know I'm a genuine Christian because I'm someone who's practical. I do. I'm always doing good works. I'm always caring for others. In fact, when I look at other Christians, they're doing nothing comp in comparison to me. Well, those who are overconfident, listen, you need to be careful because one of the realities that James is challenging throughout this letter are those who are self-deceived. So you might be one of those people when you're actually one of those people who say, I've got works. But what you lack is a genuine faith that is producing the works. Remember, you can be a person who does good works and you don't even need to be a Christian. You need to challenge yourself to see, is it, are your works the result of your genuine faith in Christ? Are you doing the good works that God prepared in advance for you to do? You're the one who needs to feel the challenge and the conviction of God's worth. But in both cases, brothers and sisters, we need to examine ourselves. We need to feel the challenge and the conviction of God's word. One of the, the, the sections of the Bible that's been challenging to me in this past week has been um, Psalm 19. Psalm 19 and, and, and these couple of verses that say this, verse 12. Who can discern his errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servants also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of transgression. The psalmist knows that, that we can't discern our own errors. That we need to ask God for forgiveness for our hidden faults, the things that we don't see. And, and brother and sister, I want to challenge you and I as we, as we feel the examination of God's word today. That we ask him to show us where we are failing. 
If we've got counterfeit faith that we need to come afresh to God and pray, God, I need, I need you to save me afresh. My faith is in your son alone for my salvation. But I know it's a faith that will prove itself in good work. If we are people who who do have a genuine faith but feel our works are imperfect, listen, we need to come to God and pray for forgiveness and ask for his help. And the reason being is because what our faith ought to showcase to this world is Jesus Christ. You see, at the heart of James's practical letter, filled with his great challenges, he wants God's people to showcase true religion, which puts on full display his elder brother, Jesus Christ. And so, brothers and sisters, the challenge in, of, of James's huge question this morning is... Can such faith save that doesn't have works? The answer is no. True faith, which is alone in Christ, but does not come on its own, comes with works. It's the one that saves. And that faith, it showcases Christ to the watching world. And if you're someone who's got no faith, you've, you've just listened on to this sermon and thinking, well, okay, there's people who can have counterfeit faith who think they're Christians, and then there's people who are genuine Christians. And the reason you can tell they're genuine Christians is because our faith is accompanied by works. Maybe the challenge for you this morning is, will I put my faith in Christ who died on the cross so that my sins could be forgiven and he was raised again so that I could live in this new life where I live to serve him and bring him glory so others can see how great our God is. It's all because of what he has done. His undeserved love and kindness. His grace that we are called to live transformed lives. Hallelujah. What a saviour. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your grace toward us. We thank you for the truth of your word that challenges us to our very the core of our being, to the very heart of our faith. We pray that we would respond appropriately to the challenge that we've heard this morning. Help us as we come to you this morning to be those who your spirit will examine, to see if there be any wrong way within us so that we might be led in the way everlasting. We thank you for your grace. May it be your grace and your love and your mercy which fuel all of our good works. We pray this in your precious and your powerful name. Amen. We're going to conclude our time and we're going to sing together that great hymn, Grace. Your grace that leads the sinner home From death to life forever and sings a song of righteousness by blood and not by merit. Your grace that reaches far and wide to every trap and nation has called my heart to enter in the joy of your salvation by grace i am redeemed by grace i am restored and now i freely walk into the arms of Christ my Lord Your grace that I cannot explain Not by my earthly wisdom The Prince of Life without a stain was traded for this sinner by grace i am redeemed by grace 
as I am restored. And now I freely walk into the arms of Christ my Lord. Let praise rise up and overflow. My song is out forever, for grace will see me welcomed home to walk beside my Savior. By grace I am redeemed, by grace I am restored. And now I freely walk into the arms of Christ, my Lord. Let me conclude us with our benediction from Jude. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fall and with great joy. To the only God our Saviour be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen. Go love your God. <laughs>